Okay, so this, this week uh, we're going to build on our knowledge and start to look at uh, key exchange. It'll all come together when we look at SSL and how we negotiate keys and symmetric keys and all the public key and, and so on. But key exchange is an extremely uh, important uh, area uh, for us to, to look at. And it's how Bob and Alice can agree on a shared key uh, and hopefully nobody can actually determine, especially Eve, uh, that key. So what's been in the news this week from a crypto point of view? What have you noticed? <laughs> Anything? <laughs> That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think Snowden revealed that a while ago, and it's just this week that it's really been uh, confirmed that that was the case. I I'll outline that in a little minute. Uh, so the CIA and I think a German uh, defence uh, agency owned this company in, in Zug, uh, Crypto AG, I think it was called, and there was backdoors. <laughs> In, in the, the crypto, and they were selling to countries such as Iran uh, and, and, other, and other states. So there was a back door uh, in that. Any other one that you saw? Yeah. Facial recognition, yeah. So facial recognition is really taken off and it has many ethical uh, <coughs> issues, and especially if you're uh, w w without consent is, is, is a major problem. So the, the one I, <coughs> I, I, I noticed was, was, was this one here, which is quite embarrassing. So I don't know if you know it, but DNS is absolutely sh a shockingly bad uh, protocol. If you want to bring the internet down, uh, bring down uh, DNS. So you can either poison uh, the, the DNS infrastructure so if you can get uh, the root, so the way it works is the root servers who have the truth on the, uh, on, on the latest domain uh, to IP resolution. And it's possible to poison that domain for a certain amount of time before it updates and, and so on. So if someone gets access to your DNS records, typically the A uh, record, uh, they can poison the, 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 the record. So uh, there's a move on to move towards what's called DNS sec that you would use a public key encryption to be able to sign a trusted uh, uh, resolution and for the first time that could be the case uh, and then all the DNS servers in the hierarchy would be trusted they would have keys and they would sign so it starts to build a trust infrastructure around uh, around DNS uh, but unfortunately they've lost the keys. <laughs> so there was meant to be a ceremony that happened that uh, several uh, security engineers would meet in uh, I think one, one place in Calif uh, California, get together, do some tests, do a ceremony, and then generate these new key pairs that would be used. The private key will obviously be stored securely, but the public key will use, be used to, to, to sign for, for trusted uh, entities. <laughs> Unfortunately, they've lost the key. So if anybody knows where they are, then please say. So the ceremony didn't happen. Uh, and the industry is quite sluggish in moving towards actually doing this anyway, <laughs> because it actually involves a bit of understanding a key encryption uh, and so on. But it needs to happen because it's a critical infrastructure in, on the internet. Does anybody know any IP addresses off the top of their head? There's one that you should definitely always know. Any number, any IP address? 8.8.8.8 .8 is the only one you need to remember. <laughs> if you're in a country and they switch off your DNS, then stick your DNS onto 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. That's the Google DNS. Any other ones? Good for you. And that one is? <laughs> what is it? Yeah? It's a secure, uh, it's a black, it's got, it checks against known phishing uh, IP addresses and so on. Uh, and then there's 9.9.9.9, .9 .9 .9 <laughs> which is uh, 
I don't know, run by the cops or something, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you should use that one. Uh, but uh, 8.8.8.8.48 .8 .8 .8 is the only one you need to know. If you want to connect, check your connectivity, that's the one you ping. If you want to check your DNS resolution, you do your, if you can ping and you can't NS, uh, you can't ping google.com, you know that you have a problem with your, your DNS, okay? Somebody can poison your DNS, somebody could pretend you've got an etc. hosts on your machine. <laughs> Someone gets on your machine, they poison your local hosts, that's where your machine looks first, uh, and it'll send it all to, to, the, to the wrong place, okay? So there's a, there's a hierarchy there, and hopefully we can start to, uh, to, to re rebuild it. So this was the one that was mentioned uh, here. It was a company from, uh, of all places, uh, Zug in Switzerland. I highly recommend that you go to Zug if you have some time. It's called Crypto Valley. Uh, very successful area, looking at cryptocurrency, blockchain, DLT, <coughs> and so on. Try to build a new world. <laughs> Uh, and because it's in Switzerland, probably that's a good place to set up open source and, and to be away from regulations of big nation states and, and so on. Uh, but unfortunately, for a few decades, this company, uh, Crypto uh, AG, had been working with the CIA and other uh, law enforcement, uh, another law enforcement agency with a backdoor in the, in the crypto, okay? And it's quite strange because we're now talking about some telecoms companies not being allowed to operate in certain countries in the world because the possibility of, of backdoors. So in, in the crypto space, as we'll find, we have almost perfect security. Uh, and the only way that law enforcement can actually uh, get into the communications is with some uh, backdoor. What's the problem with uh, backdoors in crypto, do you think? Anyone can find it. Anybody can find it, yeah. You can't keep anything a secret these days. And that secret is worth a lot of money to somebody, somewhere. And all of us have a price. <laughs> all of us can be uh, an, an insider threat. So this is where we are uh, with, with the module, if you remember. Uh, so we've covered uh, quite a bit of ground uh, up to now. Get my slides to work. <coughs> okay, so if you remember, uh, symmetric key AES, uh, hashing, that was our MD5 and SHA. Uh, public key was last week, and I appreciate it's quite tough, some of the methods that we, that we got involved with. Uh, <coughs> But please have a look at what the sample questions will be in the test so that you're, you're well prepared for that. <coughs> and this week we'll do the key exchange, which is starting, which is starting to build up the picture of, of how all of this jigsaw puzzle uh, actually fits uh, together. So next week we'll have a guest lecture and then the assessment will be around the five units uh, up to uh, here. So we'll do trust and uh, digital certificates next as a unit uh, and then that will give us our, our, our test, uh, test, test one. So get you prepared. Uh, we have a WebEx session every week on a Monday evening if you want to join that and ask questions. There's interesting things uh, asked there but eventually I'll record a lecture uh, that I'll share that will allow you to see how the test will be structured uh, and, uh, and, and get ready for that, okay? Uh, it's worth 30%, I think I might have said 25% at one time, 30, 30 and 40 is, is the test. But we'll give you quick feedback, and you'll know where you stand, you'll know what you could do better and so on. Anybody, any questions on what we're doing, where we're going, <laughs> and what, any assessments? Please ask. Uh, is, is the mini project next week? Is that worth anything? Uh, no, no. no that's, that's yeah, it's just a little uh, lab that uh, I've pulled together code from lots of different places and JavaScript. Yuck. <laughs> and we'll implement some AES and, and uh, some hashing methods and, and so on. It gives you a little, little toolkit of your own that you could uh, uh, actually create. I'm not expecting you to. 
understand all of the code and that. I've just pulled bits and pieces that I think work. And you should always go back to something that works. Typically, we go back to OpenSSL to make sure that what we're actually doing is correct, because the last thing you want is to release something you actually find you've been encrypting wrong, your salt isn't working, nobody can decrypt what you're saying, and get locked out, as you see from uh, some, some senior people uh, on, on the internet. OK, any, any questions at all, please, please ask at uh, any time. OK, so this is how it all fits uh, together. <coughs> this is the patchwork uh, the, that uh, we're actually looking at. So we looked at a symmetric key, the difference between a block cipher and a stream cipher. ChaCha20 is pushed extensively by uh, Google and is used in IoT and so on. And I think eventually we might actually see ChaCha20 overtake AES for uh, secure uh, tunnels. Then we looked at the hashing methods that we use to get a fingerprint, SHA-1, SHA-256. The slow ones, slow ones are <coughs> Bcrypt. Go and tell me that acronym. <laughs> it took me a while to, 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 to recite it. BBKDFS2, did you get that one? Does anybody know what it stands for? Who cares? <laughs> and the last one, I don't know if you know about that one. Crypt. Uh, crypt. Crypt is the other one. Uh, kind of a Linux one. So those are the, that's your toolkit uh, for uh, hashing. As I said, there are some GPU busters uh, around, Argon, Balloon, uh, and, and so on. Uh, but obviously, it's a, it's a race against the crackers. And we have our coding methods that we use, base64 hex byte. Please try and understand the different formats because we swap between them. But at its core, it's bytes. We deal with bytes. And we don't like bytes because we can't view them. So we convert them to hex. Hex in base64 is for us. The computer really only understands uh, bytes. And today we'll look at the amazing, fantastic, groundbreaking <laughs> Diffie-Hellman uh, method. And the beauty of this cannot be underlined enough. And because we're in uh, John Napier's, uh, near John Napier's tower, just down there, it's based on uh, logarithms or discrete uh, lo logarithms. And we'll see how we use logarithms to be able to create very powerful security proofs. <laughs> Unfortunately, if I was to give this lecture in 10 years' time, I would say that discrete logs are finished and gone because of quantum computers. <laughs> so they're at risk. <coughs> they're also at risk because of the computation now with the, the size of the prime numbers that we use. They're getting a bit crazy. And it's been found that lots of people use the same prime number, even though they shouldn't do it. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, and, and so on. So the method I'll outline today around Diffie-Hellman has got problems, but it's still alive and kicking in elliptic curve cryptography and also uh, in post-quantum uh, crypto. It's still there. It's a fantastic, magical thing. You won't get it in this lecture, possibly, but the minute you get it, you go, wow, that's, that's gobsmacking. Uh, well, that's just me, but uh, hopefully you'll see how great uh, that that touch of genius uh, actually was. And then we'll try and bind it all together <laughs> with, uh, with PKI, or public key uh, infrastructure, and especially looking at uh, digital certificates. One of the weakest areas in the whole of the industry is the understanding of digital certificates and in how they're used within SSL, TLS uh, type uh, connections. So hopefully we'll be able to look under the hood and understand what a certificate actually is and so that you don't make the mistake of leaking out your public and private key to the rest of the world and embarrassing yourself and your company and, uh, and breaching uh, people's uh, 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 security. Okay, so, so we're looking at various methods as we go along. Hopefully at the end of the module we'll be able to look at where the horizon is and what's coming up. Uh, next, zero knowledge proofs. Why do I have to give away my password every single time? 
Why can't I just prove that I know my, my password? Why do I have to give away my date of birth? Why do I not just prove that I know my date of birth and so on? So we need to build systems that start to look at what are called uh, zero knowledge uh, proofs. Okay, so that's more at the end <coughs> of, the, of the module. Okay, so, the, so what we really want to do is to create a shared key. It seems quite simple. Uh, between Bob and Alice. And uh, the problem that we have is Eve is likely to be listening to their communications in some way. So the challenge is really to, to, for them to openly communicate and then at the end of it, both of them have that special green key. That green key's probably never existed any other time in the whole of the history of the planet and it would take too long to be able to find uh, that, that key. In fact, it would take, as we found last week, the energy of the whole planet and a lot more just to find that single key. So not even the CIA uh, will be able to find that out. So we talk about end-to-end -end encryption between Bob and Alice. Can you tell me the difference between end-to-end? -end? and Why? Why not just use SSL and TLS and HTTPS and all that? What's the difference between SSL and TLS and true end-to-end -end encryption? What's the big difference, do you think? Why do we use end-to-end <coughs> -end encryption software rather than... So no one in between them can read the data. Yep. So that, that would happen with, uh, with SSL and TLS. So if someone was listening to the telecoms provider or the ISP, they wouldn't be able to see in the tunnel. Okay? So they're both protected in, over the air, as we would say, the transport. Okay? So that's fine. Fairly secure, TLS, SSL. What's the big difference? <coughs> Why is it I could crack... SSL, TLS, and not WhatsApp, do you think? <coughs> What's the big difference between them? Well, there's a machine here and a machine there. There's a computer at either end. SSL is designed for a machine-to-machine -machine, uh, communication. Basically, it drops the packets on the machine, it encrypts them, and then sends them over. And when it gets back up the stack, uh, <coughs> it'll decrypt. So where is the problem here? <coughs> yeah. So in here, there's a whole lot. <laughs> there's your whole operating system, your app, everything. <coughs> And over here, if I want to backdoor your machine, I'll stick in a... What would I put in? I could stick in a proxy there. Just a little bit of software that picks up uh, the data before it goes down the stack. And then I just, uh, I just modify it or take a copy of it or something like that. So the backdoors that happened in the Lenovo hack was that there was a little proxy that's put on uh, the machine and then before it goes to Google and so on, it just goes through this little, little proxy. So the back door happens here and here and it can happen on your mobile phone, uh, whatever. A listening device is set up in between. So what we really want is between the app and the app. One end of the app WhatsApp, one end of the other end of the app is WhatsApp, and WhatsApp negotiates a key. And that key is never generated anywhere else on the whole planet. <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> Only the app knows that. So if Facebook wants to backdoor as they are being pushed to, <laughs> they'll have to keep a key in escrow. <laughs> And the minute they do that, the people will say, we're not using WhatsApp anymore uh, because this is my company's IP. Uh, so there's a big debate really going on. And we need to understand the difference between 
end-to-end uh, -end encryption and uh, tunneled encryption. So there was a uh, and we turn, companies increasingly are turning away from email, as we saw last week. <laughs> it's rubbish, it doesn't have any authentication. We used uh, PGP and GPG to properly uh, use it. So companies are moving uh, towards uh, using end-to-end uh, -end, uh, messaging systems. Who uses any of those ones here? Signal? Signal, yeah, few. WhatsApp? <laughs> Uh, Wire, uh, Viper, Viber, Riot, there must be Telegram people here, yeah, yeah, good. Ah, so Telegram wins. Okay, why does Telegram win? Do you think, why, why do you use Telegram? It doesn't save on intermediate services. <laughs> it doesn't, that's it. Endpoint endpoint and, and, and it's open source software. Nobody really has control of the whole uh, infrastructure. And who owns Facebook? Uh, who is Facebook? Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> who owns WhatsApp? Facebook. <laughs> of course. Okay. And Facebook's business model is to just look at all your data and do something about it. So they bought WhatsApp. And the last thing that WhatsApp kind of did is their engineers were saying, we want end-to-end -end encryption. And then Facebook bought it because it had such a big captive base and increasing all the time. And they need to monetize this, and they really can't. So the only way they can do it is to maybe try to merge uh, all of their users together uh, and then do that kind of <laughs> integration. Or they'll have to create some backdoor metadata thing. Uh, so the cloud backups that happen in WhatsApp uh, are possibly one way they could mine your content. So you'll see your your phone will back up every now and then, and then those can th can, could then be mined by law enforcement uh, and by Facebook themselves, <laughs> okay? It's not up to us to, to wonder why. We build the tools, we make the tools perfect and so on. We give advice to companies and really they've got to understand the scope. Slack, Slack end-to-end -end encryption bit of debate here. Who knows? <laughs> it's not end-to-end -end encryption. They are now using encryption. Okay, you can feel a bit uh, more safe that Slack at least uh, does a bit of encryption now over the air. Uh, but generally, they're, they don't want at this time to be that ultra-secure WhatsApp type uh, app. Uh, they're more to do with group communications, so don't share anything uh, over over Slack that uh, you need to keep uh, secure. So there was some research done recently uh, onto the different, uh, different methods. So if, I, if someone asks you, what should you use, WhatsApp or, or Telegram uh, or so on, and none of them come out actually uh, perfect. Even Telegram uh, struggles, and it's not hitting uh, some of the some of the areas, they, they, they will typically improve each time. Um, obviously, the ones like Telegram are trying to be that most trusted uh, of all end-to-end uh, -end encryption uh, methods. <coughs> but there's, if they stick a backdoor on, on, your, on your phone, then it can be <coughs> difficult even if you're using a, a Telegram. So there's, there's a few things that they don't do. WhatsApp actually comes out pretty pretty well uh, in the, the way that it actually does. Telegram has a really smart ratchet method. It ratchets the messages uh, together so nobody can, can get in on the conversation because each message, message is entwined with this ratchet type, type thing. Uh, uh, so you see that they, they win. Uh, there's a QR code uh, method uh, for, for that. Uh, but they're, they're generally uh, strong and obviously this would, you don't really probably care about this if you worked in say the nuclear industry or you work in law enforcement or you're working in high IP and things like that. So you might use Slack for your general communications but for things that are really secure that relate to your company you might be using uh, the, these, these, type, these types of apps. 
and uh, so uh, <laughs> Snowden, Snowden uh, good people to recommend uh, your your product there. I'm missing off one at the end there. Maybe I can try and get that back back in, in there, because uh, it's my my favourite uh, uh, Twitter account. <coughs> so so, uh, so Snowden Snowden uh, says use uh, anything. I mean he's quite an authoritative source of this type of, uh, of, of information. But he says use anything with the open whisper. Uh, Signal uh, uh, is the most scalable here, free, peer-reviewed. Uh, Bruce Snyder uh, uh, really is impressed by all the mechanisms that, and, and the time that, that people take. And uh, please follow Matt Green if you can. A uh, great professor, uh, says really interesting things. Uh, he, he just likes the code <laughs> that's, that's been written <coughs> uh, for, for that. Okay, and if you really want to buy one of them, okay, you want a really safe phone, <laughs> buy that. That's the most secure uh, phone in the world. You won't get a lovely graphical interface and the latest <laughs> iOS and so on, but if you really have to, then uh, you, you buy that, 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 that uh, device uh, there. You'll see many people with two phones or three phones. I don't know if you've ever seen these people. They have one for work, one for business and one for really highly secure communications. The device is so unbelievably locked down uh, that uh, it can never be used for just surfing the web and giving to your kids to play leamings or something like that. Okay, so it's, uh, if you're interested in that, I'll send you the paper uh, that, uh, that's, that, uh, that that's actually <coughs> reviewed. Okay, so as I said, what we need to do is to understand <laughs> why we need uh, why we need end-to-end -end encryption. And as I said, <laughs> we have uh, Bob <coughs> and Alice, and we unfortunately we have Eve. And between listening to all the communications, we have the device <laughs> or the machine there. We have an operating system and apps here. And when we use our SSL uh, TLS, then the tunnel is between one machine and another. So if Eve is sitting here, she won't be able to decrypt. Uh, if we've used good key exchange, then everything's fine. When we use end-to-end -end encryption, the app itself is actually generating uh, the key. So the key exchange happens between the app rather than between the, the machines. And the one thing we've got to worry about is that if somebody hacks my private key eventually, then if somebody's been listening to all of my communications, then can they go through all my Wireshark and now uh, unpick all the keys that I've <coughs> used? So we'll be looking at forward uh, sec uh, sec forward secrecy and what's called uh, ephemeral uh, methods. Uh, is it possible that I can generate the same key again? So Eve says, yeah, they've just generated the same key again. They're not really uh, negotiating the key uh, properly. And then when we come on to SSL, we'll be assessing uh, the security of the crypto on a website using SSL labs, and that'll be able to assess any of the weaknesses that we actually have. So we've got good tools there that will actually assess the security of, <coughs> of our own tunneling system. Uh, remember, you've got sort of the weakest is TLS t uh, from uh, SSL TLS, and then we go down to IPsec, which is a VPN. That's generally the most secure that, that we get. It's proper, a proper... Uh <coughs> Okay, so uh, <coughs> okay, so we're going to we're going to look at uh, at Diffie Hellman uh, methods, some of the weaknesses uh, that that we see in them. Then we'll look at how we use elliptic curve uh, methods. Uh, probably all your connections to the internet just now are using elliptic curve Diffie Hellman 
to be able to uh, get the, uh, the key. Uh, and then finally, we'll look at uh, passing uh, a key through public key. Uh, as we've touched on last week, it's gone, it's finished. <laughs> okay. uh, in TLS 1.3, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but TLS 1.2, 1.1 will be around for a long, long time. So it's still a valid method to not use the key exchange methods of Divi Hellman, but to use the, the public key to do that. <coughs> and then finally, we'll look at what's called a key distribution uh, center. Can we, <coughs> as a company, create a place that manages all the keys for us? Uh, and that, that's obviously a, a challenge. Okay, so what we're trying to do is to be able to create uh, a system so that, that Bob and Alice can openly communicate uh, and not to be able to know the key that we've actually created. The key we create is a 256-bit <coughs> AES key or a 128-bit AES or a 256-cha-cha-20 key. It should be created through random methods. Okay. This all falls down if you've not got a random number generator on your uh, machine. If you're flawed in creating that random number generator, and I can guess roughly what your random numbers are going to be, I can crack all of your, your, your keys. So this is truly random numbers that is generated as a, as a key and Eve will not be able to find, uh, find it. And it was this genius here, Whitfield Diffie, who actually published it. A wacky, crazy idea about using these log methods that we all hated at school. <laughs> uh, I don't know if they even still teach logs at school, but uh, they do, yeah. <laughs> Pesky logs. I'm going to come back to them. You're going to love this. <laughs> uh, so it was him that uh, came up with a method that was mathematically uh, secure and proven to be secure uh, from, from there. So he came up with the Whitfield Diffie method, he published it, I think he even got a patent uh, on it, and it was truly groundbreaking, and <coughs> we're still using it uh, today. The other things, the two th other things we need to consider in our key exchange is what's called uh, forward uh, secrecy, FS. <coughs> and if there's, a, if there's a leakage of the, uh, sorry, that should be private key then, if there's a leakage, you have a private key, uh, your keys can then be generated from that private key in the future. If that private key is leaked to the internet, say, then whoever's been listening uh, to your communications can actually discover every single key that's been uh, created. So FS makes sure that that doesn't happen. So if you're working in a highly secure environment, you make sure that you have FS turned on so that even a hack of your private key will not reveal all the keys that you've used uh, in the past. The other thing is what's called ephemeral. And with this, uh, sometimes your system doesn't work. And because of the randomization, we end up with the same en encryption key as we've used before. So ephemeral methods make sure that even <coughs> though we have the same uh, parameters that are negotiating the key, we will not end up with the same en encryption key. So if possible, <coughs> on a highly secure site, you want to make sure that both of them uh, are on. And in SSL labs, if you get an A plus on your site, it means that you're using these methods and you're using the latest things like public key pinning and, and, and so on. When we look at uh, digital certificates, we'll see what, how you get that, that rating. Uh, most sites will get an A. If you want to be highly secure, you're getting a, a, an, an A plus for, for that. Okay, so the method is based on, on, on logs. <coughs> so if you remember from school, <coughs> if you took five to the power of two and five to the power of three, what does that become? <coughs> what, what does it become? Five to the power of five. If I take five to the power of two 
and then take that to the power of 3, what does that become? 5 to the power of 6, okay? I hate bringing back memories of school, <laughs> but uh, this is where we are. <laughs> and this is your security uh, that this, this is based on. Okay, so it was that genius John Napier uh, who, who did that. I mean, crazy, <coughs> hundreds of years ago he came up with this and he found ways to simplify multiplication and, and powers and so on. So generalised, <laughs> it's that. And, and it's that. And we use this uh, with inside the Diffie-Hellman method to keep things uh, secure. <coughs> so basically what happens is that Bob generates a random number, uh, Alice generates her own random number, and they should be hopefully uh, <coughs> truly random. They then agree on a value, uh, I don't know, two or three or something like that, and she raises hers, uh, he raises his to the power of, of x, she raises hers to the power of y. They then send them over to each other. And then Bob raises the value he received to the power of x. And uh, Eve, uh, Alice will take uh, the, the one she receives and raise it to the power of y. So why does that work? What is that? Get the same, which is a to the power of x, y, and a to the power of x, y. This amazing, simple, fantastic little thing. <coughs> we could end up with amazingly long numbers that just go on, shh, that go on forever and ever. So we bring in one thing and we bring in a prime number and everything becomes the mod of uh, P. So both Bob and Alice must openly agree to a value of A here. <laughs> we typically call that G, generator value, and a value of P, which is a prime number. The security of the whole system depends on what do you think? <coughs> What's the core to security here? Yeah, yeah so they, they need to be big enough. Yeah, 256 should be pretty good because uh, it'll take a while to go through all of them. What else? The core of the security of the whole method depends on one parameter, x and y, definitely. And what other parameter matters a lot? <laughs> the prime number. <laughs> the longer the prime number, the more numbers that are going to be created, the more you're going to have to uh, search through. The core of the Diffie-Hellman method is that length of the prime. Please do not use 512.738 in your company. Please, please, please. <laughs> uh, as we saw last week, they are hackable. People can pre-compute lots of tables and things like that and make it, make it all work. So the length of the prime number really does, uh, really does matter. Okay, so that's what we end up with and it, uh, it actually uh, works. Okay, so generate a number, uh, <coughs> g to the x, mod p, we'll see in this case, we exchange the values and we end up with the same key. Right then, do you want me to try it live, just to make sure, who wants, who has a computer with Python opened or something? Does somebody want to, to exchange a key with me just now? Somebody, please, one person with a computer open, you want to do it? <laughs> we'll try. If this doesn't work, then maybe, maybe we've found a flaw in the, uh, the Diffie-Hellman method. <coughs> okay, so, uh, so just le <coughs> let me go uh, here. Okay, so we've just uh, opened up uh, Python in there. So don't tell me your, your random number. Uh, you can be Bob and I'll be Alice. I'll be Alice for a change. So I'll, 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 be, <coughs> I'll be Alice. And so let's, 
What's your favourite prime number? <laughs> it, was la it was asked in a, on a programme. What's the programme? Uh, it was asked on a programme. I was watching a programme a few weeks ago and I go, yeah. What was, they asked the, the general public, <laughs> what's your favourite? What's, <laughs> what's your favourite prime, prime number? I, I just couldn't believe it. It's, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I know it's a boring question, but never mind. And uh, so give me, a, give me a prime number. Give me your favourite prime number. <laughs> give me a prime number, anybody? A, a, a kind of big one, <laughs> if you can, just to make sure. 499, are you sure that's a prime number? <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll, we'll try that uh, from, from there. So I'm going to go four, 449. 499. Sounds a bit suspicious if you ask me. Okay, you got that one? You got it. Four. Yeah, please, please check it because it is prime. Okay, that's that's that that's fine. Okay, so we've got our our prime number. So we're good. Uh, my favourite prime numbers are ninety-seven, nine hundred and ninety-seven, <laughs> two to the power of two hundred and fifty. This is uh, so sad. <laughs> <laughs> two to the power of two hundred two hundred fifty-five minus nineteen. Okay, y you'll see why I pick that one. It's called curve two five five one nine. <laughs> 2 to the power of 255 minus 9. I, I remember that, okay? When, I, when I'm testing my code and so on. And the other one is, uh, is 2 to the power of 19 minus 1. There you go, see? That's, do you know how many bits that's got? 19. <laughs> do you know how many bits 2 to the power of 255 minus 19 has got? 255. So if you're thinking of a really big prime number, there you go. There's, there's a few for you. But 97 will do. So hopefully, hopefully this is going to work. Okay, uh, Bob, so you pick your own number and I'll pick mine. Uh, so, uh, sorry, no, no, we need to agree on a G value. Uh, let, let, let me do one little thing here. Oh, yeah, that, that's, that's the phone that you maybe want to, to buy if you're in a secure environment. Uh, so just let me check one little thing before we uh, agree. Not all G values are possible, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so just let's see if I can find my little, uh, my little checker. Um, Python is your friend here. So uh, just let me see if I can find my little checking program. Selecting G. So we picked, we picked, uh <coughs> oh no. Oh no, it only goes up there. Okay. I hope this I hope this will work. <laughs> <laughs> I would normally check that, that this is a valid G value. So let's go for a value of uh, three. Okay. I hope this will work. Okay, you got that one? Okay. Right then. So you pick your value. I'm Alice. So I'm gonna pick my value and uh, from the audience pick a random Number less than four four, 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 four. Was it four nine nine? Is that we did pick that? Yeah, was it Thir thirteen? Okay, we'll go for thirteen. You pick your own one. You're Bob, and don't tell me your number and don't look at his screen. Okay, I know you're looking at his screen. <laughs> ah, terrible. Okay, so so my uh, value that I want to uh, compute is is what. What do I want to compute? Yeah. You sure you got that round the right way? <laughs> Good. So it's uh, 3 to the power of 13. And then what's next? Mod. And in Python? Percent, yeah. And uh, uh <coughs> don't put the little carrot thing. You know, that carrot in LaTeX, that's what you do. Don't do that. Do you know what that operator is in Python? XOR. <laughs> Big difference between XOR and, uh, and that. Okay, so I'm going to do that. You're going to do yours, okay? So I'm going to do g to the power of a uh, mod p. <coughs> Don't tell me what your is, but I'll tell you mine. 
Okay, I'm 18. Tell me what your value that you get for your for your big B, the value that's going to pass. Tell me what it is. 265. 265. <laughs> that's a bit worrying. <laughs> okay then. So so Bob's value is 265. Okay, I'm a bit worried now. <laughs> Does anybody want to put money on this? That I'm going to get this right. Two. What is it? 265. <laughs> okay. Anybody want to put any money that I'm not going to get the right answer here? No, never bet against a professor. <laughs> That's what I say. Okay, so you now have my value. Okay, so now uh, <laughs> I hate to put stress on you. Uh, so what do I need to do? What do I need to do? Tell me what what values I need to do. Tell me, help me, help me, help me here. B to the power of uh, a to the power of a, yeah, and mod p. p. <laughs> okay, so you'll do you'll do it differently. Only you know b. Okay, so you'll do whatever I I, <laughs> I passed you. Eighteen to the power of uh, thirteen. Uh, sorry, I, I don't know you. I don't know that value that you've got. <laughs> don't let me put things in your head there. You will do 18 to the power of your secret mod P. Does that, that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> Please let this work. <laughs> okay, so everybody agree that I'm okay? We're, we don't know about him. If, if we get this wrong, it's, it's your problem and not mine. <laughs> we were right. Okay, everybody agrees? You, you, you must agree. If as long as you agree, <laughs> then, then I'm okay. And, and you agree over there? Okay, so we're, we're fine. Everybody want to put money on this? I will put, put money on this right then. So I want you to write <coughs> down your value there. <laughs> and wrap it up, okay? Oh, I've already shown it. So <laughs> yeah, part, no, but it's the same. <laughs> oh, but it's not the same. Oh, you might have wrote it in a big way. <laughs> <laughs> he has written on his sheet. <laughs> You can verify that says that says 48, just to make sure to, for the camera. That says little 48. <laughs> you write it big the next time, look. 48 is the answer. And I didn't tell you that was the answer. Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> okay, that's good. Did anybody bet against with against me there? Nah, nah. Don't 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 do that. <laughs> not, not very good. Okay, so in ask the exam, <coughs> Python is your friend or a calculator, or something like that. The problem if you have a Mac, then uh, the calculator's rubbish. Uh, it's just not got that mod, or as I remember, there's no mod in there. I get, I'm geeky, I get an old uh, HP. I don't know if you know the old HP calculators. Uh, I've got that on my phone. Uh, they're great little calculators. You get a Casio or, or something. I think they've all got the mod, so make sure you find the power of y to the power of x, uh, is that one up there? And mod, that's all you need. No other thing is, is, is possible in there, okay? So make sure you go through some examples that's not difficult and it's a really easy one to answer in, in, the, in the test. Okay, luckily it worked. <laughs> there. So that was good, nothing like a, like a live demo. Uh, to go wrong and uh, <laughs> okay so that's that's what we did wasn't that magic <coughs> from there and <coughs> we show uh, an example here um, I think there might be a slight flaw in the slide again but what I outlined just a minute ago is the right aesthetic <coughs> method it doesn't always work okay it doesn't always work uh, <laughs> So if we pick a p number, a prime number, it doesn't happen that uh, we get the right uh, we get the right value uh, each each time. So we can quickly go through the values. If we get what's called a ring, uh, where uh, for every value of x we get a unique output, then everything's fine. <laughs> it's called a ring. 
it's got the finite field if you want to get into that kind of <laughs> calling something with a difficult name. Uh, but it, it goes round. This one, does this one work? <coughs> if I picked a, a generative value of three, does that work? No, because it's repeating too quickly and, and different, different values gives us the same. <coughs> I, we've lost something there. So for this prime number of 11, that works, that doesn't work. Uh, that doesn't work, that works, that works, okay? And uh, in Python, it's just a few lines of, uh, <coughs> of code. From there, there it is. <coughs> okay, nobody's expecting you to, to know that or do the spreadsheet or anything like that, but a few lines of uh, code. If I pick a prime number of uh, 31, then those are the only values of G I can actually uh, use. Uh, and my favorite prime number, yeah, I knew I had it there, 97. <laughs> I can't use two or three uh, anymore. Ow. <laughs> I can only use uh, those, those values, okay? So, uh, so that, that's how you pick your value. It's called the generator value. That's your G value. Uh, and you will need to make sure that it works or it will actually break your, your, your crypto. <coughs> so what does this really mean? Uh, well, in real life, we're dealing with very big uh, prime uh, numbers. And the strength of the prime number gives us the strength of the, the, the method. So uh, we, we can uh, generate our... our our values for G and for the prime number uh, using OpenSSL. <laughs> As we always start with, always OpenSSL. But OpenSSL will allow us to create our, a secure prime number and a generator value. And hopefully, sh hopefully it will check that the G value is OK for the prime number that we've, that we've selected. Does anybody know how, you, how, how it does this? I know how it, it does a prime number. I'm not expecting you to answer, but does anybody know roughly how it gets that prime number? Just generates a random number of a certain size, 600, 768 bits in this case. <coughs> and I just keep walking some way until it goes, oh yeah, I found one. Yeah. And that's purely random to actually find that. And it doesn't take too long before it will actually find a, a contender. There are different ways to check for primality, and it can take some time, a few seconds or so. Uh, so this program here will probably take a few seconds to generate that one. Uh, so you need to check that that truly is a prime number. But that should be prime. <coughs> we've generated it there, and then we've generated our G value, and we're good to go. That's, we now have Diffie-Hellman, because We've got our G value, we've got our prime number, and then we just need, and we just share that, between Bob and Alice, and they just generate their X and their A and B value, and, and we're good to go. But the weakness is, is that you define the group. <coughs> group number one is 768. Don't go anywhere near that in a corporate environment. It is crackable, <coughs> possibly. You should all start with group two, 1,000-bit uh, prime, or if you want really good security, it's a 1,536-bit prime number that's actually uh, generated. And it happened <coughs> that uh, a good part of the internet was crackable. <laughs> and it was this paper here in 2015 that actually found that people were using the same prime number, for goodness sake. <laughs> you go, what? You are meant to change the prime number. This is just a, don't use the default. That's kind of standard thing. Generate your own prime number, because if you've taken someone else's prime number, somebody's already pre-computed all of the values that are possible. And people have massive arrays of, of things. If you tell me what your prime number is, I'll take a while and I'll pre-compute every single possible value of X 
and why. On the other side, and you're stuffed, because <laughs> I'll find out eventually uh, what you've actually used. So this paper there found that 7% of the top 1 million sites on the internet were using a default <laughs> prime number that was well known. That's a lot of sites <laughs> in there. And if the top 1 million are using that, you can imagine that the lower end of the, of the internet <laughs> is not going to have a clue about even what a certificate actually uh, is. Uh, Apache was uh, hard-coded uh, in, into there, and uh, in this case, 3% uh, were, <coughs> were using the default for that one. And if you're interested, that's it there. <laughs> Not a secret. <laughs> there it is, and everybody knows about it. It's well, well defined. Uh, so please have a look at this, uh, this paper. Really interesting. Do you know what that vulnerability was called? Was it logjam, logjam, freak, or oh, beast? They're all going back. And they all go back to this problem. Uh, the US uh, had an export embargo around uh, these methods within the Netscape. And <coughs> they've really caused a lot of the problems <coughs> that we have uh, for, for, for this. OK, so Diffie-Hellman, the core method, suffers because Eve can be in the middle and you don't know if you're talking to Alice or, or at all in the tunnel. You're talking to Eve, you negotiate <coughs> one key through Diffie-Hellman. Eve then negotiates with Alice and generates another key and she becomes Eve in the middle and she uh, decrypts, re-encrypts and so on and Bob and Alice never actually know. OK, so it is flawed as a, as a core uh, method because we're not authenticating uh, either side. The way that we normally do it these days is with elliptic curve uh, methods. So if you remember elliptic curve, you have a generator point, you pick a private key and your public key becomes that point added n times. That's your private key, that's your public key. OK, so your private key looks a bit like that, your public key looks like that, and we both agree for the curve that we're using, that's the generator point uh, uh, there. So how does that work with, uh, with <coughs> key exchange? OK, so that's what we went over, that's what they look like, there's the prime number, there's the A and the B value and the generator point, uh, and so on. There's your private key, your public key, that's the... Where's this used? Can you remember? If you're lucky, you've got some of these because <laughs> they went from 7K Bitcoin. Uh, I think it was over 10K the last time I, I saw it. So this is a Bitcoin. Uh, that's a private key in the Bitcoin. That's your, your public key uh, in there. So that's what that actually looks like. So this probably won't go in straight away, but the magic is with this. So now we use the same kind of thing, but Alice generates her A value and Bob generates his, his B value. <coughs> and they can be just for the session. They don't have to be a long-term public and private key. For a new session, they create a new key pair. So Alice generates A, Bob B, small values, small values. And she multiplies or <coughs> adds that generator point by A and then Bob by B. They send them over and all she does is multiply the value she gets at the end by the value that Bob sent. And then the other way, because of multiplication, that uh, 5 times 3 is the same as 3 times 5, uh, then it all works. <coughs> and they end up with the same shared key. Everything is done mod P. So we agree on P, we agree on G, and we agree on the basic parameters uh, of the curve. And in the end, we end up with the same uh, shared key. This is elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, E, C, D, H. You'll see it everywhere, and it's what we use typically. Never use core Diffie-Hellman. Always use uh, some, something uh, li like, like this. 
As I said, it's used in the Tor network uh, last week. ECDH is used to negotiate a key uh, for every node. Each node then takes their, passes the key back, or sorry, they don't pass it. Of course they don't, because you negotiate it. So no one who's listening to the communications anywhere can reveal any of the keys because it's a elliptic curve Diffie Hellman is used. And then the first node does this onion skin. That node takes its encryption key off, AES. And then this node takes that encryption key off. And then eventually this last node <coughs> takes that. Typically 256-bit AES keys, but it's elliptic curve uh, Diffie Hellman that's, uh, that's in there uh, doing it. <coughs> One curve that's used fairly extensively in Tor and many other applications is what's called curve 2519. <laughs> The prime number is 2 to the power of 255 minus 19. It's easy to remember <laughs> that as a prime number, and it uses a value, the x value of 9. And it's used extensively because there's a whole set of curves that were defined by NIST, and some people think there's a back door in there. Whoever sits on the standards committee could be saying, yeah, here's a good curve for you. Why don't you use that? And in the background, they know that they've cracked that curve. So nobody trusts the standard curves, the P5112s, P256s. Most of the industry has taken this one uh, as, as their, their most trusted uh, place. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll have a break <coughs> for five minutes, and then we'll come back and finish this off, and then we'll have a little test. Does anybody have any questions? At all. We've covered a lot of material <coughs> and it really needs to be uh, uh, studied uh, with the class. If you, if you take 15% of this, then you're doing very well in the lecture. Okay, thank you. Right, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have a, 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 a quick look at, uh, at passing uh, the key through public key encryption. But as I said earlier, it's not a good method. It's not got forward uh, secrecy built into it because if somebody manages to get your private key, then they will reveal all of the keys that have been uh, passed. So if I've got some time when we look at SSL, I'll show you uh, an example of how Wireshark uh, can take the private key and it will reveal uh, the key that's been used and then it will decrypt the, uh, uh, the, 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 the traffic. <coughs> okay, so rather than using an elliptic curve and Diffie-Hellman methods, we can pass the, the secret key that we have uh, through, through public key encryption, such as RSA <coughs> or, or elliptic curve. So in this case, uh, let's say Alice is Google, and this is Bob uh, here. So Google, when you connect to their website, they send you their uh, digital certificate. On that digital certificate, it's their public key. Okay, you check, as we'll see, the public key to make sure that it's been validated by, by someone, a trusted entity, say VeriSign or GoDaddy, and you know that it is Google's public key and it's not a fake key. Then <coughs> you, connecting to Google, will create the key that you want to use uh, for the connection, a random 256-bit AES key. <coughs> You'll then encrypt with Google's public key and then send that back. So this is part of the handshake that we have in SSL. There's an initial, uh, what's called a client hello and a server hello. It's a standard, it's open, everybody can see exactly what goes on. It's kind of weakness of it. You can actually see what gets negotiated and what gets passed back. So then it's up to Google to take its private key and there it then decrypts the key that Bob sent <coughs> and we now have the same key on, on either side. In this case, we now create a tunnel, and the tunnel will use AES 256-bit, and nobody will be able to find the key. But the biggest problem with this is that if Google, and say an insider in Google, releases the private key to the world, then everything that has been encrypted with that public key is now uh, open. And there are... Uh, entities who record every single packet. Uh, I've seen a lot of security companies 
they'll pull out the wire shark trace. Oh, I think something happened six months ago. Bang, there's the wire shark trace. Because your logs are great for identifying things, but you want to have a look at what happened six months ago when someone clicked on a phishing email and what did that look like. Uh, so there are companies that will do a carbon copy of interesting events and then you'll be able to pull that up and then hopefully be able to timeline it and so on. So the problem here is really uh, the, <coughs> the leakage of that, of that private key. And then finally, how do, this, is what, this is where companies are struggling. The internet is quite big. I don't know, uh, f 4 billion IP addresses or so, uh, and then all the private IP addresses. It's kind of big. <laughs> but it's going to be dinky compared to where we're going. So with IoT and sensors everywhere, uh, the internet will become massive. So how does a company protect its edge? <laughs> So uh, I'm sure that isn't going to go for the main firewall and the main servers and stuff like that. They go for a Cisco phone. They go for a kettle. They go for a... a <laughs> you might laugh, but uh, I'll show you my kettle. <laughs> it opens up Telnet. And guess what the password is? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. You've got a kettle. You put the kettle on the internet. Uh, then you're just asking for trouble. Shodan will show you the kettle and uh, you're in through Telnet. Why anybody wants Telnet on a kettle is beyond me. Uh, I mean, as we know, I mean, put SSH, if anything. <laughs> telnet and uh, all, all the devices I have have Telnet enabled because the device manufacturers want to get back in and they forget that it's still enabled and so on. Hopefully in the, uh, in the UK and the EU, devices will now be tested against some security framework so they don't enable Telnet on your kettle and, and so on. Or your fridge. I want to, get a, I want to buy a fridge. <laughs> you know, these smart fridges don't do it. Do you? So <laughs> and do you know, I saw a, I saw a company uh, 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 who do the robot factories and things like that in the, U the UK. It's amazing to see these robots. They know what you're going to buy before you buy it. You, you know that? <laughs> you go, I want a pint of milk. And They've already ordered it. They've already gone to the farmer and it's already it's on its way to you. <laughs> and they can think that well. They're using machine learning for that and they, they, they think ahead. But they're thinking about drones that go into your house. So the problem for them is parking outside your house if you live in the city. <laughs> it's not easy. And then having to go up all those stairs and things like that and knock on your door and you're not in and all that kind of thing. I don't want to get rid of that. You want to get a little drone that comes into your house opens up your fridge. <laughs> uh, ten years time you say, yeah, that's nothing. Yeah. There'll be, there's drones in my house today. Imagine how hackable uh, that is. <laughs> into your house, into your fridge, stealing all your food and having a wee <laughs> rummage around. So they, well, they do it. They're talking about uh, smart robots that will take your, your food right into your, fr into your fridge. With smart fridges. <coughs> Steal the drone. Yeah, yeah, you go, there's, there's Peppa Pig being delivered. We get that for the Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> go get it. <laughs> okay, that's not in the syllabus, by the way, okay? So don't, don't, don't quote that example in the, uh, in the test. So the problem that we've got is that how are we going to secure the edge, the fog? Let's call it the fog, the, the devices that are floating around that <coughs> connect. <coughs> and that's where the intruders are going to come in. They're going to come into the Cisco phones. There was a picture of Obama, I think, and he had, uh, if you want to hack Obama, he was sitting behind, uh, in front of three Cisco phones or so. That is, can be the conduit. Once you're into the network, you can then discover what goes on and so on. The defences are onion-skinned, lots of defences around the data, and it's the devices on the outside. So is it possible for us to create a complete infrastructure where we can manage the keys, take control, understand what encryption is actually used? <coughs> One way that we can do this is that uh, we have a trust infrastructure. We uh, share keys. So Bob and Alice register their keys, their long-term keys, with a trust server. Obviously, this is a central point of failure. So you're stuffed if it fails. So you have probably a, a secondary one just in case it crashes.
But this is going to be a single attack place because all the secret keys are actually stored on there. So Bob and Alice register their keys uh, here uh, for that. So Bob and Alice send their <coughs> keys uh, to, to, <coughs> to Trent and keep them secret here. So in this case, Alice wants to talk to Bob. So she doesn't talk to him directly anymore. She talks to the trust server. So she says, I want to talk to Bob. Uh, Trent, can I, can I do it? Then what happens is that, uh, is that this is the key that they're going to use uh, from there uh, for their communication. So uh, <coughs> uh, Trent will take, uh, take Bob's key and encrypt that new key with some sort of ID and time and things like that and send that back uh, encrypted with uh, Alice's uh, key in there. So we're taking the key, encrypting it with Bob's, and that goes in a little sealed envelope in there. The key's in there, puts in the sealed envelope, and then it goes in another sealed envelope, and the sealed envelope is on, can only, uh, it's called the box method, as you can see, and it goes back to Alice. Alice then <laughs> unpicks, unpicks the key, and she can get that. <coughs> then she sends the sealed envelope on to Bob, who only has the, the right key to unpick this, and they'll both have the same key. Can you tell me the advantage of that as opposed to what we saw earlier? Well, one thing is that Trent can keep a key, a copy of the key, just in case they need the key. Maybe there's been some leakage between Bob and Alice of information. Then there's a key there, so, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> let's take that key. So it's now possible to audit your key and to manage them and to kick systems off. If you don't trust them anymore, you, you, you're not allowing them to communicate. So only Bob and Alice can communicate in this system. Trent can't come along and talk to Alice or Trent uh, or, uh, or Bob. So we now manage all of the connections that we have and we make sure uh, that they're actually secure. <coughs> a little more advanced, uh, we have a session key, uh, in, <coughs> in, in this case, session key that uh, the KDC decides that Bob and Alice is going to use. We encrypt that session key with Alice's, uh, Alice's long-term key. So that gets sent back uh, to Bob. Bob then gets a request to say, you're going to talk to Alice here is the session key for you, and it's encrypted with your uh, key. Okay, so this is trustworthy. Uh, this to the minus one just means decryption. <laughs> so Bob decrypts with his, with his long-term key, Alice decrypts, and they're, they're good, uh, good to go. So they now have uh, the key, and we'll now keep a copy of that. If you're interested, that's in Python. That's roughly, I know we don't use ECB. <laughs> Never use ECB uh, <coughs> ever, UCBC and so on and so on. But that's the kind of simple uh, program that we would actually create to, to create that uh, working. And there's uh, an example of it. There's the two long-term keys. This is the encrypted versions that go to Bob and Alice. And then when they decrypt, they end up with the same shared key. Okay, I think this is the way that things will go towards a key, uh, a, a key, a KDC, key distribution center. It's the only way that you'll manage all of your IoT devices is to make sure that you manage what they're doing. Uh, and they're not really complex devices. This could be a sensor. <laughs> it's not going to do fancy public key encryption <laughs> for you uh, and an extensive elliptic curve, this and that. It'll be lucky if it can run AES. So this would work in an IoT type infrastructure. Obviously, your problem is going to be in the KDC. Okay, there's another way that doesn't involve you sending it to directly to uh, Bob. Uh, you take your session key, encrypt it <coughs> with uh, Alice's key, and also encrypt it at the same time with uh, Bob's uh, long-term key. Send that all back. Uh, she finds that, and it's up to her to now send uh, the message and also the box that uh, Trent, in this case, has encrypted. So she sends a message, 
along with the box that he can open and find uh, the key on it. Really smart way <coughs> of, uh, of dealing with that. But your attack is going to be on your trust centre. If that goes down, you're stuffed because nothing can really happen without it. But it's the only way you're going to manage the millions of devices that you're going to have uh, in, your, in your infrastructure. Okay, so that's been an outline of Key Exchange. Uh, I've got sample <coughs> questions on the site <coughs> that you should have a look at, but definitely, 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 you'll have to do that little Diffie-Hellman method. You saw me do it with Python. Please, can you do the same? We'll do it in the lab today, uh, and you just need to understand that, that, that basics in there. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> we covered a lot, uh, but uh, uh, we'll now do our test there. Good, we've got half an hour, so <laughs> take our time. Okay, 11.42.86. Uh, so these questions are not representative of anything that might be in the text. Okay. <coughs> I say that now. Okay, so remember, you've got uh, the GitHub, and there also should be a link from uh, Moodle. Uh, oh, for that one. So just uh, make sure that uh, each week you have a little look at, at the content. I'll update if anybody finds any problems with any of the, the lab or the... The lecture material, uh, I push through a, a, a Git update from there. So the lab for today should be, should be there. <coughs> right then, 11.42.86, is everybody ready to go? Can you see, okay? Yeah. <coughs> okay, get yourself registered. a bit slow. <coughs> <coughs> okay, we're good to go? Yeah? Good. Uh, yuck. Wait till you see these ones. Oh. <laughs> right then. Okay, so uh, more, more points you get uh, for the answer. Uh, which app does not use end-to-end -end encryption? Uh, WhatsApp, Slack, Signal, Telegram, or Viber? Which app does not use end-to-end uh, -end encryption? Yeah. Yep. Yep. <coughs> Good. <coughs> uh, WhatsApp, Signal, Telegram, Viber are end-to-end -end encryption. So in your company, uh, please, <laughs> If you work for law enforcement or GCHQ or wherever, uh, or the NSA, which I'm sure probably quite a few of you will end up working there, uh, uh, don't use Slack. Okay. <laughs> oh, here's the private key for the energy network in the UK. There you go. That's as secure. No, don't lose that. Okay. So for the for the <coughs> a six seven for the for the eight who said that. Okay. Just just have a look at the first couple of slides that had. Uh, in there, and uh, I know WhatsApp is, is kind of Facebook and all that kind of thing. It is, it is pretty good for the crypto, mostly uh, from there. Okay, <coughs> so let's see who will get a job for, uh, for law enforcement. There, oh, it's quite a lot. Quite <coughs> very close, Julian. It's Julian. Good. Well done. Good for you. Well done. And ZK Snacks is excellent. <laughs> we'll come back onto that. And Helen Eats is always there. Always there. Come on, Helen. Come on, Helen. Uh, and uh, Kat, 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 yeah, good, good. Oh, okay, I want, I want, uh, and Snowy Fox is still there, and it, 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 and ZZ. Z, that's <laughs> <coughs> okay, so, <coughs> oh, God's sake. Oh, dear. <coughs> Uh, g to the power of x times g to the power of y. What is that? G to the power of x, y, g to the power of x minus y, g to the power of x plus y, g to the power of x divided by y. <coughs> oh, yuck. Yeah. 
Yes, back of the nets. <laughs> Who got that one right? Well done. Good. There was another. Bob, you can put your hand up. And you did it there. There's one more person that got that one right. Good for you. Well done. <coughs> okay. Can you all see where you went wrong? Apart from the geniuses in the room. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely not right. <laughs> uh, that's the divide. If you divide, if you divide that, that's what you get. Okay, just we don't do that <coughs> thing. Well, we do, we do. Sorry, yeah, we do, we do. Uh, it's the only thing that needs a bit of more Python code is that operation there. You just can't do that kind of thing uh, from there. Okay, so let's see the six geniuses who got that one right, and who was the fastest? Did you, did you answer that one fast? Oh, it's Bob. Bob. Bob, 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 yes, <laughs> Julian again, Katri, and ZZ was the fastest there, who's ZZ? Good, well done, ZZ as in just the end of the alphabet, <laughs> you're a regular expression in the, in the making. Uh, so uh, Bob, come on Bob, this week, this week, you're, you're the winner, okay, and no Pintman today, and uh, Helen, Helen, what happened there? God, slipped your finger, sorry. Uh, Snowy Fox, Snowy Fox always, always does well every week, so hopefully. Uh, due to the power of X, <laughs> to the power of Y. What did John Napier say that was? G to the power of X, Y, G to the power of X minus Y, G to the power of X plus Y, or G to the power of uh, X divided by Y. Okay, I expect you finished. Did you do that one? Oh, yeah, the professor does it. <laughs> Nearly. <laughs> Getting there. Nobody went for that one, which is really good. That's excellent. G to the power of X to the power of Y is what we use in the Fay-Hellman method. Uh, and uh, that's equal to G to the power of X, Y. So, well done. Who, who got that one right? Put your hands up. Yeah, 18 of you. Go, go, keep going. <laughs> well done. That was excellent. Okay, so come on. <coughs> Ooh, it was quite close. Bob, Bob was the fastest there, were you, Bob? Bob was the fastest. But you just didn't, you need to be faster. It's just not good enough. And you're number one uh, again. And Julian, I'm sorry. <laughs> and ZZ and Bob and uh, the rest of you, you're just nowhere, okay? <laughs> you just need to improve. Okay, so he here, here we go. Uh, so I'm so sorry about those two, okay? Just wipe them from your memory completely. <laughs> okay, after key exchange, which would be a typical key uh, created? <laughs> would it be a 1K RSA, a 256-bit AES, a 256-bit elliptic curve, or a 64-bit <coughs> salt value? <laughs> after that key exchange, what do you think is typically there at the end? And it's an encryption key, AES, metric encryption. No, because it would be too difficult to encrypt big content. No, for the same reason, public key. Uh, and that's just a random thing there. So 13 of you got that right. At the end, we go back to AES encryption. It's the fastest uh, that, that we have and highly optimized. So, uh, Snowy Fox did well there. What's happened? You're a bit slower. Did, did you? Right. Oh dear. <laughs> okay, and Julian is way out in the in the lead again. <laughs> well done. Uh, you're still in there. So you find ZK and Bob. Uh, and uh, well, Helen, what what did you go on that? <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> okay. So uh, so Julian is way out in the front there. Uh, so let's see what our questions are uh, coming up. <coughs> Which is not a prime number. Oh, God. <laughs> your, your brain hurts <coughs> now. <laughs> oh, don't pick 97, please. <laughs> oh, two people picked 97. Good. <laughs> 
Oh, oh, look, three and three, three and nine, you remember, school? Right. You divide by three. <laughs> I kind of tried to give you a little clue. I didn't make it even, that would have been too easy, so I stuck it at the end. Uh, so who, who's, seven, who's seven people? One, two, Bob! Yes, Bob! Come on, Bob! And there, that's only three, come on, who, who else got it right? Well done. There. It's like at a knock, you go. <laughs> uh, be bold and uh, be, be courageous and if you get something right then uh, uh, be proud of, uh, of uh, your achievements. <laughs> that's a brilliant distribution there, that's, uh, that's excellent. So 97 is my favourite prime number, okay, I did say it at the start, you can rewind back this lecture, I did say it. What, tell me the, my, my other one, there you go, that's how much you've listened to me. <laughs> can anybody remember my second one? <coughs> To oh, that is just brilliant. I mean, that, uh, if I end the module now, then that's <laughs> probably the, the peak point. What were you saying? What was the number? What? Same. Same. Oh, and the other one? 990 something. Oh, 90 something. That's just not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> you just tailed off. Where I got 900. Uh, <laughs> No, it's not 95. It might be. 997. 900, you'll remember that now. Can you remember my other one? <laughs> I bet you can't. Excellent. Go and check that. It's, it's what's called, I can't remember who discovered it. <laughs> there are certain prime numbers. If you do 2 to the power of something minus 1, it's a prime number. There's only so many of them. <laughs> if you're geeky enough, you, you try and find the next one. <laughs> okay, so let's see how we go on. Bob. Come on, Bob. Come on, Bob. This is your week this week, Bob. This is your subject. <coughs> and who is the top one? Bob. Wow, look at that. Whoosh. There we go. Gary, Snow Fox, and then there. Julian didn't do... Oh, it's so close, Bob. Come on, come on. Get, get this one. And, uh, oh, they're slipping. <laughs> come on. <laughs> okay, and Zed, Zed, you're just slipping in there. And uh, Gary? Gary, well done. You're just, you take your time and you just take it. Uh, I'll, I'll try the first few in it. <laughs> Getting there. It, 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 you know, it's not good. That's good. <coughs> yeah, very close this week. Interesting one this week. <laughs> if only we had the prize at the end of this, that would be great. Oh, oh, what is this? I've mucked up here, haven't I? Where did it come up? What guards your previous session keys <coughs> from being hacked? Forward secrency. Uh, <coughs> you got that one? No. Did it come up strange on your phone or something? Yeah. Something went a bit wrong there. Sorry about that. There's another one for the, like that one. So, <coughs> right, Bob. Umbrella. Umbrella. Bob did well there. And much the same between Bob and Julie. So close. Up. You've only got, just get in there that fraction of a second faster and you'll be okay. Okay, so Katri's still in, in there. Umbrella, who's Umbrella? Uh, and it is an umbrella, by the way. <laughs> uh, that's fine. Okay, so hopefully this one will be okay. Hopefully this one doesn't muck up. Uh, for ECDH, uh, Bob generates B, Alice generates A, and we have a point G, what's the final key? A, B, G, A, G, B, G, A plus B, G, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Ha ha, yes, yes. <laughs> I know you've only learned it today and I've known it for years, so it's okay for me. <laughs> it's so obvious to me that the answer is A, B, G. <laughs> Please, for the test, if you remember anything, go on, remember that one, you've got marks and... and <laughs> Did you get that one right? No. Who got that one right? Wow. Who else? Oh, Bob. Oh, this is, this is such a, this is such a, oh, such a battle of, of the great minds. <laughs> so two people got that one right, okay. Uh, it took me a while to realize what this was doing. You take a point, A, Alice multiplies her value by A, Bob uh, multiplies his by by V, the points, the exchange, 
Alice uh, multiplies Bob's value, BG, by A, and they end up with ABG, okay? That's <coughs> the way it is beautiful, and it works extremely well, until quantum computers come along, and it's gone. <laughs> Okay, so if you play this lecture back in 10 years' time, which I'm sure YouTube won't even exist by then, there'll be some other method, then uh, I'll scrub that last little bit. So it's A, B, G. Please remember that for the, for, the, for the test. So let's see the two people that got that one right. I think it's Bob and Julian. Oh, oh no, it's Umbrella. Umbrella. Oh, oh, we could see Bob for the first time in the module. Oh, isn't that amazing? Come on, will we just stop now? <laughs> You are so far in front. Have you been reading up on elliptic curve key, key distribution? No. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a wonderful achievement. And uh, you're actually quite far in front for that one. Did you know the answer with that one? Did you remember what I said? Or did you just kind of half guess? You knew it? Great. See, see, listen to him. When you're doing your exams, this is the person to, to speak to. <laughs> and me too. OK, uh, it's me second. If you've got phone a friend for that last elliptic curve question, or is it a prime number, Bob's the guy to, 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 to call. OK, so let's see if we can keep Bob at the top. <laughs> OK, next question. Uh, which guards against the same key being generated even with the same parameters at either end? Ephemeral methods, forward secrecy, Diffie-Hellman <coughs> methods, or elliptic curve methods? Two seconds, two seconds. <coughs> okay, it's ephemeral method. Oh. <laughs> uh, do you want me to admit that uh, I've mucked up? None of them. Okay, something else. <laughs> the correct answer is here, of course, and 11 people didn't get that, didn't get points. You got, I'll do this early in the morning, for goodness sake. I'm, I'm, up, at, I'm up at half past four, slogging my guts out on that. <laughs> I, need, I didn't have my coffee before this, so you need, to, you need to excuse me for that. I know you're really... Did you get that one right, Bob? Yes. Oh, isn't that so sad? So hope, hopefully, hopefully nobody, nobody's correct. Okay, see, there you go. That was a disaster. Okay. Still Bob. See, I've got a little switch here, and I want Bob to win, so I just, <laughs> I just flick the switch. Yeah, the answer is 48, if you remember that one. And that would be great if I integrated that into the test. Eh? You just, I've got some little worker over there. <laughs> what was the answer that, uh, that Bob and Alice got? <laughs> yeah, that'd be good. I'm going to do that. Right then, so I don't know how many more you've got left, Bob, but uh, just, just keep it up there. Bob? Well, Bob, there you go. Bob picks 3, g of 3, and x of 3, and a prime of 11. What's g to the power of x mod p? I know it hurts your brain. <coughs> oh, yes. One person got that right. Bob? No. Who got it right? Oh, well done. Hey, did you do it? <laughs> this is a crypto class, for goodness sake. <laughs> oh, that's right. Okay. Ah, oh, you shouldn't have said that. You should have said I, I did it in my head. Yeah. Some people have got the natural ability with, with kids with ciphers. You go, how did you do that? That sees a I, I don't know. And they don't have a method, and they just they have that natural ability to crack codes. So we'll say that you have the natural ability to guess the right answer. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Okay, and why did you go for three? Because it's in the middle. <laughs> okay, so that should change a little bit. <laughs> Somebody check that answer, by the way, just rewind it back, just in case I've got the right one there. I did it at half past four this morning, so... Uh, oh, <laughs> oh, Bob, you've got snowy for... Oh, yes, well done. <laughs> I need to shake your hands. <laughs> Okay, th thank you, Bob. Uh, right, okay. Well, that, uh, that, was, that was good, that, that Bob won that one. Does anybody have any <laughs> questions on what we've done? We've done a lot. If you understand 10% of this lecture, you're doing pretty well, okay? 
So please go over uh, the principles and then study up a little bit more. I'll see you in the lab in, in, a, in a little while. So thank you for, for that. That was uh, very entertaining. Uh, and uh, we'll do... <laughs> I can't even remember what we'll do next week, but uh, we'll have a look at something else next week. <laughs> okay, thank you.